We thought about this final panel, an opportunity to come and reflect uh, a, a final time on um, a final time on the big questions that we're facing that the work of Thomas Berry has uh, uh, brought into uh, our consciousness. And as, um, as I thought about connecting with uh, our own faculty here at Georgetown, uh, besides the involvement of uh, Father Leo Lefebvre and Father Peter Fan and others, um, I couldn't think of a better person than one of our university professors, uh, John Robert McNeil. And we, we met actually last summer through Mary Evelyn. She set up you know, the contact between us. Um, John McNeil was uh, born and raised in Chicago and um, received his bachelor's degree from Swarthmore and his doctorate from Duke University. And um, he, uh, his bio on the, the university website says that he has cheerfully served two masters here at Georgetown, at least since 1985, as a faculty member of the School of Foreign Service and of the History Department. And from 2003 and six, he held the Cinco Hermanos Chair in Environmental and International Affairs until his appointment as a university professor, which essentially means you can teach any damn thing you want, right? <laughs> university. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Brain surgery is my next. <laughs> any, any, top, any topic in any department. And he teaches, and he writes, and he lectures. Um, He's co-author with Peter Engelke, Engelke, Engelke. Engelke of The Great Acceleration, where we are focusing today an environmental history of the Anthropocene since 1945. And, and five other books, Mosquito Empire, Ecology, and War in the Greater Caribbean, and uh, the book with his father, William McNeil, The Human Web, A Bird's Eye View of World History. I can remember the day in class when Father Thomas advised us, everyone should go out and buy a copy of William McNeil's A World History and read it over the weekend. <laughs> it's a tribute to your father. Um, so, uh, John, I turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much, John. And if you did buy a copy of that book, I'll, I'll probably owe you a nickel for the royalties <laughs> that uh, ultimately came my way. So um, I may get up and move around a little bit because I feel more comfortable speaking to a room when I'm uh, standing rather than sitting. Um, but I'll begin with a confession. I have a confession too. Uh, I am not a Barryite. I may be the only person here who never met Thomas Berry. I may be the person in the room who knows the least about Thomas Berry. But the more I learn about Thomas Berry, the more surprised I am that I haven't known more about Thomas Berry uh, hitherto. Because there is a lot in his work that uh, I won't say anticipates, but um, relates to the kinds of things that my colleagues in global environmental history and colleagues with whom I'm working more recently who are geologists interested in the Anthropocene have been working on for decades. None of them, as far as I'm aware, aware of Thomas Berry. Berry comes at these things with a different perspective from the one that my colleagues and I bring, or the ones in the plural that my colleagues and I bring, which I'm going to acquaint you with very briefly here uh, in approximately ooh, 20 minutes. I realize that I am one of the few people standing between you and the beginning of Halloween festivities, so <laughs> I will not uh, natter on too terribly long. So first, I'm going to speak about uh, a couple of concepts, the Great Acceleration and the Anthropocene, and 
uh, what the relationship between the two of them is. And along the way, you will be able to see connections or incipient connections, possible connections, to the work and thought of Thomas Berry. I'll also be trying to explain why I think the Great Acceleration has happened, and I'll do so in terms that are very different, I imagine, from what Thomas Berry would offer. So, the Great Acceleration is a term in use in recent years to describe the bizarre, unprecedented, and wildly unsustainable acceleration of resource use, environmental change uh, on the global scale. So an Australian scientist, Will Steffen, has created what are sometimes called the Great Acceleration Graphs. This is the first, of eight, first nine of 18 of those. And these, as uh, he wrote, refer to Earth system trends. And uh, even if your eyes aren't good enough to read the fine print, the general uh, idea here should be uh, conspicuous to you. And perhaps the most important thing to recognize is that the time horizon on all of these, or just about all of these, when a screeching acceleration begins is the middle of the 20th century. When, to generalize, most of the people in this room were born, give or take a few years. And it's not coincidence, because behind it are a lot of trends in the social system, some of which I'll show you in just a moment, that are uh, ultimately responsible for this characteristic of the uh, great acceleration, that chronological characteristic. So the term was born in a workshop in 2007, and it's in use in the global environmental change uh, community. And it's Will Steffen, more than anybody else, who has uh, spread the gospel of the great acceleration. And um, it should be understood, I think, both as, as I write here, a period of human history and a period of Earth history. But unlike the Anthropocene, which I'll get to shortly, or Anthropocene, it's not a candidate for inclusion in the geological time scale. It is instead a shorthand way to recognize and refer to what I regard as indisputable, the scale, scope, and pace of modern global environmental change. <coughs> Excuse me. Here are the trends in the social system that, according to Will Steffen, underlie and contribute to and guide and shape the Earth system trends of the first uh, nine graphs. This is actually more than nine. This is 12 here. I wouldn't have chosen exactly the same set that Will Steffen chose here. So from my point of view, uh, international tourism and telecommunications, maybe they're not so uh, significant in changing the global environment, even if they do have the same signature chronology to them. Uh, with 1950 as the beginning of a screeching acceleration. Bear in mind that these graphs are global averages and that conceals the tremendous variability locally and regionally around the world. And there is a critique of global averages precisely because of what it does conceal that um, I recognize but I won't go into. So Thomas Berry might explain the Great Acceleration in terms of culture and outlook. I explain it in a much more narrowly material way, emphasizing first and foremost <clears throat> the energy system that our species built since 1800 and especially since 
1900 with fossil fuels, specifically coal and oil, at its center. That to me is far and away the most important driving force behind the ecological tumult on a global scale of modern times, especially since 1950. And I'll show you in a moment uh, some uh, graphic uh, data about that. And secondly, uh, population growth. A lot of people disagree with me about the priority that I would give the energy system. A lot of people disagree with me about whether the population growth deserves to be anywhere near the top of the list. This is the way that I see it. Mind you, I recognize there are lots of other things that I'm not getting into uh, this afternoon. I would mention the pressures of the international system. <clears throat> I would mention the uh, ideas that are encapsulated in the profession of economics, among other things, including culture, as driving forces behind this tumult. But let me focus uh, briefly on the energy system and uh, population trends. So um, here is the wellspring of the great acceleration, this enormous expansion, middle of the 20th century in uh, energy use, uh, especially fossil fuels. The significance of this of Significance of this is um, multifold. The piece of it that you're most uh, acquainted with is probably the chemical concentration, excuse me, chemical composition of the atmosphere, specifically greenhouse gases, specifically carbon dioxide, that results from this energy system. And in this thin band on the right of the graph, you can see that parts per million of carbon dioxide have recently exceeded 400 after a long-term average, this is 800,000 years on the horizontal axis, a long-term average between 180 and 280 parts per million. This is the rhythm that helped tap out the ice ages of the Earth uh, over the last uh, several uh, million years. But we have, in terms of what's going on in the atmosphere, escaped from that uh, bound of normality uh, in the past half century. And where that will lead, nobody knows. That is part of the significance of the energy system. But there are also all sorts of other indirect effects of uh, burning uh, fossil carbon on the scale that we have done uh, in recent decades and of um, using the energy contained in fossil carbon. I'll give you just one example. All the uh, energy intensive machinery that has been used to mine billions of tons of ore, to cut uh, millions of hectares of forest, uh, little of that would have happened without the energy from fossil carbon. So there are indirect effects which are really important that make the energy system as central as it is to the great acceleration. Also important, although in my view not as important, uh, is the fact that the human population has doubled since the middle of the 20th century and has increased tenfold since about 1800. The narrow line is the rate of population growth, which peaked around 1968 to 72. The blue shading is the size of the global population, which is now at about 7.5 billion. I would not take the projections, that's the light blue, uh, all that seriously. Um, their value tails off very quickly after 10 or 20 years. Um, what I want to draw your attention to here um, is once again, despite that arrow, 
uh, which I think I misplaced, <laughs> or maybe the translation from PC to Mac has relocated my arrow. <laughs> At any rate, I thought I was putting it in here. Again, the point of inflection uh, in this curve, the middle of the 20th century. Um, but I want to draw your attention to one other thing about this, which is the declining rate of growth, declining as rapidly as it inclined uh, throughout the course of the 20th century. And that is why, or part of the reason why, I think that uh, the great acceleration is decelerating, even though the Anthropocene is uh, set to continue, as I will argue in just a moment. So here's um, some different Earth system trends presented uh, graphically, although once again, uh, the middle of the 20th century is a point of inflection uh, in this uh, stacked curve. So what is the relationship between <coughs> the Great Acceleration and the Anthropocene? So the Anthropocene, as most of you have heard, is a proposed uh, time interval in the geological time scale. But since that term has come into circulation over the last 20 years, it has come to mean different things to different people. It has been uh, conscripted in literature, in philosophy, in every imaginable academic discipline and used to mean uh, slightly different things. I work with a lot of geologists. I cede sovereignty to the geologists over terms that are proposed as units of time in the geological time scale. Well, there are lots of people who would not do that, who would say, it's too important to let the geologists define the Anthropocene, so I'm going to do it instead the way I want. That is not my position. At any rate, um, the arguments about if the Anthropocene exists, if it is to be formally adopted, when did it begin? And how would we know? The so-called Anthropocene Working Group, 37 scholars, most of them scholars and scientists, most of them geologists, are recommending a mid-20th century birthday for the Anthropocene. That suits me very well. I think it's the best of all possible choices. But there are a lot of people who would say the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the harnessing of coal, so maybe around 1800. And there are lots of people who would say even earlier in time. But for me, the Great Acceleration is the first phase of the Anthropocene. For other people with different Anthropocenes, the Great Acceleration is a latter phase of the Anthropocene. I apologize that this is confusing. But to reiterate my position, they begin, both of them, in the middle of the 20th century. But they're different because the Great Acceleration is slowing and it's going to end. The Anthropocene, as an interval of time, whether an epoch or an era or something else, in geological history is set to continue for millions of years, I would predict. Now, that probably depends on the future history of glaciation, but the future history of glaciation is on indefinite postponement. So here's why I think the Great Acceleration is slowing and ending, and the global scale ecological tumult that we have known in our lifetimes is likely to uh, abate somewhat. First of all, the energy transition. Fossil fuel based energy system is going to go. I can't tell you when, I can't tell you how, but it's going to happen. I would guess within uh, 50 years it'll be substantially different with a far smaller role for fossil fuels. It's already happening in terms of price, as you can see in the graph on the left. A few more um, improvements in technologies, a few fewer subsidies for fossil fuels, and the game would be over with a very rapid switch to a basket of renewables as the uh, mainspring of the energy system. 
Secondly, as I showed you a moment ago, and I'll show you again, the um, hectic <coughs> growth of human population uh, in our lifetimes is slowing. The rate of increase is now half of what it was in 1970, and there's every indication that it will continue to decline, and global population will stabilize, although, as I said, projections aren't worth much, and we can't say when or at what level. The UN experts say 9, 10, 10 and a half billion. I would also predict that after that it will continue to decline and not just stay level. And if you want to know why, you can ask me why. <laughs> so what might this all mean? The Anthropocene, I say, is set to endure the human imprint <coughs> in a thousand different ways is not going to dissipate uh, anytime soon. The extinctions that have been caused and are being caused are forever. That will always be there in the paleontological record. There are other things, mundane things that we do, I'll give you one example, that will last for millions of years and be detectable if there's anybody around to detect them. Here's the mundane example, metro systems. So there are about mm, 200 cities in the world that have underground metros, Washington being one of them. And a lot of earth has been moved to put them in place. They will crumble in time. But the signal of metros will endure because there'll be no consolidated rock in their spaces. There will be unconsolidated jumble of metal and concrete and sediment and uh, rat bones and other things. <laughs> it will be a signature of metros, and there'll be 200 of these around the world. Come what may, whether there's glaciation, whether there's uh, gigantic asteroid impacts, whether there's nuclear war, there will be a signature made by the metros that will last for millions of years. <laughs> whether it's comforting or disconcerting, I leave <laughs> to you. <laughs> so um, what might all this mean? That's where uh, John and Mary Evelyn come in because uh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and, and <laughs> enjoy Halloween. <laughs> There are two other people in the way between Halloween festivities uh, responses. So, uh, so John, your father was an extraordinary influence on Thomas Berry. Um, the Rise of the West was one of the first books that were really time to take the whole into consideration. Uh, he was a central figure, as we know, in world history. We now have global history. We now have environmental history that didn't even exist in his lifetime. Uh, we have big history as well. And I remember quite a few years ago in Philadelphia, uh, when your wonderful book on the 20th century, Something New Under the Sun, came out, and I was um, an intimidated young whatever, I guess, assistant professor, and was responding to you. Um, and I said, because of this Barry <laughs> impetus, um, I said, well, what you're saying, which of course is in the Great Acceleration even more condensed and more materials, and as you said, some things you couldn't put in that book and others. Um, so it's, ve it's very clear and very powerful and very well documented what you're saying. Um, but I did say, well, why, and it's very similar to here, why will you not, and it's fine, but I think it's good for this audience, why do historians not want to, um, it's not really a crystal ball, but with this amount of evidence um, and with your really quite extraordinary understanding of world history, um, why would one not want to, first of all, of course, I want to hear a little bit more about the population issue. But why would one not want to say, with some other scholars, what is it going to take to get to, 
not just sustainability, but flourishing. In other words, we need this historical lens. We need this deep time view. And I'm not asking you to step out of your historian's objective uh, and ex an amazing contribution. But what is it going to take, do you think, to get us to flourishing of societies and civilizations? Uh, that's an unbelievably difficult question <coughs> because um, when have uh, human communities flourished? What do you mean by flourishing? Would you say that Paleolithic societies 50,000 years ago were flourishing? They Would did, you they did feed themselves. They yes. They take care of their health. They have a political system. They have the, the potential for educating next generations. Um, and they can do this minimizing warfare. It's never going to go away. But to provide for their children in a minimally flourishing way. <laughs> minimally <laughs> flourishing. So um, <laughs> she stepped back a little bit there. <laughs> Uh, that doesn't make it much easier, Mary Evelyn, <laughs> <coughs> because I would say that a lot of human communities, by the standards that I've just heard, are at least minimally flourishing. And I would also say that by those standards, the proportion of human communities that are minimally flourishing is probably higher now than at any point in the last 200,000 years. But, <coughs> That depends on the value that you place on certain components of flourishing. If, for example, you estimate uh, highly the significance of um, rough equality among individuals, then what I have just said is radically untrue. And there is no moment in human history in which, well, let me be a little more cautious. There are probably very few moments, if any, in human history in which social inequality was greater than it is today. But <clears throat> if you take, as I am wont to do, the things that are most easily comparable and measurable, like life expectancy, well, never in human history have as many communities flourished as they do today. Never in human history have as many communities been as healthy and as well fed as they are today. So if those are your variables, then we're on a favorable trajectory if it can be sustained, which uh, in current configurations I'm quite convinced it cannot. But if justice in the distribution of uh, goods and opportunities is a more important metric to you, then the trajectory um, since the first transitions to agriculture are unfavorable. So how do we get from here to flourishing? It still depends on what pieces you estimate as more important than others in your definition of flourishing. I hate to waffle like this, but um, I, I cannot reduce flourishing to a, a, a single uh, index and say this is how we get there from here. Now, <clears throat> having waffled, <laughs> I would say that the because I regard the environmental variables as importantly as I do, I'd say the first desideratum in almost any kind of flourishing is the energy transition. And if I were a benevolent dictator, this would be my number one priority. Everything else, so to speak, is derivative uh, upon that. So if you want a s simple answer, that's it. But I don't want a simple answer. <laughs> I, I, John, do you have a comment? I'm struck by a basic question, which I want to carry on for just a bit. 
Why would humans do this to themselves and their habitat? The curves of the great acceleration, the sense of diminishment of raw materials, diminishment and diminishment, and seems in so many ways, even with the increase in some of the graphs of, of activities, it results in a diminishment. And uh, so that's what's driving my basic question. I would say because the <coughs> um, individual incentive structures and most group incentive structures are counterproductive from the point of view of the entire entirety of the human community. So I have lots of uh, personal incentives to uh, uh. make a lot of money. I'm not doing all that great, but I'm doing okay. Uh, consume a lot and uh, live in comfort regardless of the ecological costs because I do not pay those. Those are paid by everybody. Mm. And e every other individual on the face of the earth is in approximately the, the same position. Perhaps even more importantly, there are entities, collectivities, that also have incentives to try to maximize the their access to resources and to labor and to money, regardless of the implications of those quests for everybody else. So states have these incentives and uh, firms have these incentives. And even in a way, universities have these incentives, although most of us who work for them like to think they're, think they're gentler than uh, mining companies, for example. I do believe that, <laughs> not just being uh, facetious here. So uh, there is, you could say, a disconnect between the uh, collective uh, um, benefit and the individual and uh, sub-collective group benefit and the incentives attached to those. You could explain it in different ways. You could say that, uh, for example, and many people do make this argument, that um, the long-term process of hominin and human evolution has wired our brains so that we want to uh, consume because we were formed in circumstances of scarcity and when we see fats and sugars, we want them. Personally, I don't believe this all that much because I think the true nature of human nature is to have elaborate culture and so that culture can override whatever residuum of human nature may exist within us. By virtue of values? Or what is it in the group that would override that, those? By virtue of culture, by virtue of teaching, by virtue of shared beliefs. Ah. And of course, there are a zillion different cultures, and some of them uh, push in one direction and others push in another. And of course, this is, I think, what the great work was all about, yeah. is trying to get a culture that does the job a little uh, bit better than. How do you uh, react to this observation? Uh, I'm struck by earlier, one of the speakers, uh, Heather, uh, made a comment about the intelligibility, the coherence, and the continuity of the universe as Thomas Berry saw it. And she laid out rather uh, interesting uh, description of how the human reacts to these uh, realizations or awareness of intelligibility, coherence, and continuity. I was, I was really struck listening to you uh, the great acceleration is filled with uh, intelligibility, coherence, and continuity. So it strikes me that one could see the uh, cosmos, uh, the human coming to some realization of the cosmos in this regard. But so also, this great diminish diminishment, this great acceleration is also marked by some inherent rationality. But the, then you mentioned the cultural values, or that's my term at least, I'm laying, imposing it here that uh, Thomas Berry had another perspective when, when he was talking about the human specifically and uh, reaction to uh, a perception that the human had. And I'm wondering if that perception uh, is how you would react in, in terms of the great acceleration. 
he would say that um, when the human fears that it will be destroyed, uh, it reacts in a destructive manner. We destroy ourselves lest we be destroyed. And his example was the Black Death and the, uh, the sense of religions entering into a self-destructive phase and uh, a distancing themselves actually from creation and opting for a redemptive model. And I'm wondering if that kind of uh, anal cultural analysis has any traction with you, the sense of uh, we're per we perceive, we're destroying ourselves, and we accelerate the destruction of ourselves out of a uh, very deep fear. That's a <coughs> grim prospect. Um, <laughs> <coughs> so first of all, um, w with respect to religious reaction to the bl Black Death, I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see in the history of Islam w a community that was uh, deeply affected by the Black Death mm -hmm. in the 14th century, uh, any sort of self-destructive tendencies or and even in the uh, history of um, Christianity, I, I'm not sure I would be convinced by Barry's argument there of a few flagellant sects uh, notwithstanding. Put that aside. So um, in the context of the Great Acceleration, what I tend to call tumult and wh what you have called, uh, I think, uh, destruction, I, I I do not see that the uh, human community is responding to a recognition of these trends with um, a spasm of uh, self-destructive behavior. Maybe I'm just too um, naive to see what is there plainly in front of me, but first of all, I don't think that uh, most human beings are reacting mm -hmm. to the ecological tumult and the trends of the Great Acceleration. M many of us are dimly aware of them, but treat them as um, a secondary or tertiary priority because, I mean, Greta Thunberg notwithstanding, because um, while these are anxiety-producing trends, they are not going to ruin my life tomorrow, or at least the probability that they would do so is low. It might be 10 years, it might be 50 years, and I, as human beings, <clears throat> you and I and just about everybody else applies a discount rate, as the economists put it, to the future. There's so many uncertainties that we do not react today to prospects that seem to be important 10 years from now or 50 years from now. Now, there are some people who are different in this respect. There are some people who, and there are some aspects of our lives that we do govern differently. So an, an example of that is uh, education. People plan for a future when they choose what kind of education they want, either for themselves or for their children. And they're thinking 10, 20, even 50 years down the line. But in most aspects of our behavior, we do not do that. So I'm disputing the premise that um, humankind is, is responding in choices that it makes collectively and individually about its behavior, responding to the Great Acceleration and the data of the Great Acceleration or the stories of the Great Acceleration. I think that's, mm -hmm. it's in the background, but we decide as we do and behave as we do for other reasons. So I think that's been true, John, for a long time, but I think we're rapid, it's a rapid acceleration towards waking up. And I just give a couple examples. The people in California, PG&E, and, &E, and yeah. the fires. The people in 
uh, Houston, the people where fracking is disrupting their life all across the country, the people who are trying to get across the borders because of environmental changes, the people in Africa, and we can go on and on, the Syrian crisis due to drought, um, et cetera. I think there's a profound awakening, and even our um, Yale Communication Climate Change, <clears throat> Tony Lacerra would says now it's eight in 10 Americans who realize climate change is absolutely real and it's going to affect them and their children. And certainly, I think our students are more than aware. So I agree with you for the most part. You know, that has been, uh, with, oh, people aren't aware. They are so aware and people aware in minority communities um, all over North America, I would say. But let me just end with two examples. Um, if the insurance industry is finally coming out in a transparent way, Swiss Re and Munich Re have been saying uh, climate change is real, but in April, Chubb Insurance, Evan Greenberg came out in the shareholders meeting to say climate change is an existential threat. We can no longer afford to insure coastal water properties, fire and drought ridden areas. That's a watershed, major business coming on board and saying, <laughs> this is here. And people know that because of rising seas. I was just up on the Cape, 300 people dealing with what's happening on, on Cape Cod. And the, the other thing is, I think this is not yet visible, but I think it would be a game changer in terms of this uh, awakening. And that is the Department of Defense here in DC since the 90s has been saying climate change is a national security issue. All of our bases, all over the world, uh, especially Norfolk and San Diego, you can't even get on the Norfolk base uh, on certain days, you know, because of the rising seas. And we're not going to get gates <laughs> to stop, uh, you know, put in technological fixes for this. So I just think insurance is a, as a change game changer and the Department of Defense, if we can elevate that into visibility, we have the possibility of passing a threshold, I think, of awareness that is uh, growing but day and night. I really do think so. It's possible the Department of Defense has been, as you say, talking about this for at least 30 years yep. now, and um, it has made differences at the margin. Uh, the 200 U.S. military bases that uh, may have to be uh, decommissioned yep. because they'll be underwater in 30 to 40 years. But what I'm saying is that, yeah, people are aware of this, but they aren't doing much about it. They don't know necessarily what to do about it, but I think, and I know we're gonna have questions, but I think your really important point, John, that this is the greatest energy revolution in human history, and if we can make that, I think that is where people's energy is going. And I think, I think when John was bringing up cultural values and so on, um, I like to think of this, and this is just, I'm throwing it out there, but you're saying this is a physical energy change, it is. But I think in terms of human values, um, we can make the energy change, but it's also a change in human energy. What are we going to put our values into? And it's not just GDP. The American dream as a materialist dream is over. It's a nightmare in the White House. And that's why Barry was saying, we need a new dream that's aligned with these processes of nature. So solar, wind, water, these are, this is a new alignment of physical and human energies. I think that has a lot of possibilities of going forward. Let's hope you're right. Let's hope. I do think, um, though, that uh, Tom Barry would uh, enjoy your work, would read it, because I, I think what you've identified is what he often talked about. We are at a point where the human factor is the greatest ever in the future of the Earth, barring external events, as happened 67 million years ago. But, um, and I think he would appreciate how you've helped focus it even more. Yeah. Uh, and I think he would incorporate that if he were working on the, on the next book. In a way, he is through many of us. I think we're gonna take a few questions because I know we had one up here, right? Uh, so one in the front row here. John, uh, you may have answered this, but just to clarify, our, 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 uh, Father Alex Steinmiller, a passionist, are you saying that as regards world organizations like UN, et cetera, world governments are not taking what you're saying seriously? On a rhetorical level, they take it very seriously. Um, 
on the level of doing what would need to be done to <clears throat> change things like the energy system? No. Mind you, the UN doesn't have all that much authority in the rel relevant spheres. The, the no. authority lies at the moment mainly in Beijing and Washington. Question over here, right here. Thank you. Hi, Rabbi Fred Sherlander Dobb. This is maybe putting a finer point on Mary Evelyn's question to you, John, using uh, Barry's terminology. I think nomenclature matters, and perhaps you've written on this. Um, you are part of the Anthropocene Working Group with, with anthro at the center, whereas we are here acknowledging Thomas Barry's dream of the Ecozoic era. And what the next thousands or even into the hundreds of thousands or beyond years are going to look like probably has a lot to do with the next century or so of those curves that you were showing us. So inflection point for sure, and just uh, that creative tension between framing the time that we are bringing upon ourselves as Anthropocene or as Ecozoic era. Okay. So nomenclature probably does matter, and that's part of the reason that some of the people in favor of the Anthropocene are in favor of the Anthropocene, because they think it may serve to give a term to a set of phenomena that are pretty complex and not necessarily all that easy to understand, but <coughs> if they can be referred to um, conveniently, will become a bigger part of public consciousness and um, public policy. That's the hope. Now, whether Anthropocene is the right word is another controversial matter, and there are a lot of people, uh, especially in anthropology, um, but also in every other corner of the scholarly world and the activist world, who don't like the term because of the anthropo prefix. And um, if it were possible to come up with a different and better term that everybody would like, I would be in favor of that. Anthropocene has the has two advantages, I guess. One is the advantage of incumbency, because it's been in circulation for 20 years, thanks to the atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen, who apparently blurted it out in Cuernavaca in uh, the year 2000, I think it was. So the advantage of incumbency. Uh, but the other advantage it has is the uh, anthropo prefix, which has some merit to it insofar as you understand this as alluding to the significance of human activity in changing the fundamental earth systems. And some people regard this as an accusation of blame, some people as an attribution of responsibility, uh, some people don't like it because it masks differential responsibility, some people having a bigger role than others. But um, none of the alternative formulations are winning the war of nomenclature. I tend to use uh, the great acceleration except when I'm talking about geology, but that's not winning either. Yeah, sure. The Anthropocene is win winning the war of nomenclature for better or for worse. Other questions? One up here in the front. This is, here you go. It does seem, if you're correct, that, um, and, and, and it is what Greta is saying, that we know the facts and the data, but we're really not doing much about it. And if there is so little time, it does seem like cataclysm is possibility. And as I understand the story, cataclysm leads to emergence. So the question of whether the next century will be Anthropocene or it certainly doesn't appear to be Ecozoic, but the Ecozoic could come after a cataclysm. <laughs> 
so if you if we understand the story, and it does seem with the data, and the fact th of, of how fast we're moving, that that is a possibility. Mr. Thomas Berry said we were, and the term, of course, is all these terms have their <laughs> issues, but he his understanding way before the Anthropocene even was being used as you know moving beyond the Holocene was we're at the end of uh, this 65 million year period of the Cenozoic period. Uh, and so he was trying to get people to think on that geological level of the extinction that we're experiencing, which is on the hall of the natural history floor. We're in a sixth extinction. We have the possibility of stemming the tide of destruction and so on. So how do we mark these, you know, our, uh, the geologians, the ge geologists will tell us, of course. But I do think what he was trying to say and against great odds, you know, is if we can lay the foundations for a new period, and that will extend for <laughs> tens of thousands of years, but, and that requires, as someone said in an earlier, um, we need new educational <laughs> systems, we need deep time from environmental historians and so on, we need a new story, we need lots of pieces of how we create culture and endurance, that's why, I you know, asked this question about flourishing. But I think it's, it's not an impossible task to create certain elements of a culture that will help us through what Ed Wilson calls an hourglass of extinction. We're going through loss of a million species and so on. But anyway, Thomas's idea is we lay the foundations for something going forward. We're not gonna create all the dimensions of it. It's not gonna emerge like the age of Aquarius or something, and, well, and so on. Uh, can I build on that, and John, ask you the, uh, the graph with the radical population drop. Uh, if the great acceleration is the first phase of the Anthropocene, I was wondering if that uh, significant drop, if you see that as a next phase of the Anthropocene, which could be then very much, not so much uh, catastrophic, but opening new possibilities, diminishing populations, yeah, so yeah. forth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, my fond hope is to get from A to B without the cataclysm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree, I think it's possible. In my, if my analysis of uh, modern history, modern environmental history is correct, then the two top priorities are, one that I've talked about, change the energy system, and two, hasten the so-called demographic transition, uh, which is partially reflected here, but he here's more specifically what I mean. More formal education for females, mm -hmm. and um, no, shall we say, um, Romantic ruralism. Now, there are a lot of people who are interested in environment who do like romantic ruralism. <laughs> but the great virtue of urbanism, or one of the great virtues of urbanism, is it's a um, <clears throat> powerful suppressant of fertility. <laughs> As is formal education for females. So far, always and everywhere in world history. So. If I'm right and population numbers are significant and people dispute this with me, well, they don't dispute it with me, they dispute it. Mm -hmm. um, they would dispute it with me if they had the opportunity. <laughs> then um, these are the two arenas uh, in which to focus effort. But these are also tied up with uh, culture in the following sense that achieving any public policy goal is a whole lot easier when it is um, in sync with cultural values as opposed to out of sync with cultural values. And so the kinds of things that Mary Evelyn was talking about 10 minutes ago are um, part of the equation, even if I, perhaps as a result of spending more than 30 years in the School of Foreign Service, tend to think of things in terms of policy and how to achieve the political consensus that will deliver 
a specific kind of result in terms of the energy system or human reproductive behavior. And I'm emphasizing the reproductive part of behavior because I am not one who wants to see people dying faster in order to regulate population growth. I want to see people reproducing more slowly in order to achieve that outcome, particularly people who want to reproduce slowly but are in social and familial circumstances that prevent them from reproducing more slowly. And there are mi hundreds of millions of women around the world who fall into that category. Yeah, terrific. I think we're going to stop because we could raise more questions, but we're at 4.30. We can continue the discussion here. Final thoughts, Mary Evelyn? Well, I think Thomas Berry would be pleased by a number of things from this conference, but I really have to say, because he was a cultural historian, he would be enormously pleased by having John McNeil here, who has contributed so much, and we are so thrilled that our student, Jose Palms, is his student now as well. And I just want to say, my grandfather, Carlton Hayes, was a historian at uh, Columbia. And so the value in our family for history, the perspective it brings, for the immensely hard work to deal with text and tradition and library work, and now, especially in collaboration. And I think what John has put in motion is that scholarly excellence, collaborative work, and questions before us that are so provocative and so insightful um, that we will go from this conference, I think, filled with this last session in very, very thoughtful ways. So I thank you, John. Yeah, thank you.